Welcome to the BioCell webinar number 77. So today we have uh, Giacomo Fiorin from NHC, Humbert Santus from CNRS, and Jerome Hanin, uh, sorry, Enan from CRS. I'm Alessandra from uh, the Royal Institute of Technology, and together with me is Otto from uh, Finnish IT Center, and we are hosting for BioXL this webinar. And the title is uh, Colvars Collective Variable Modulus for Molecular Simulation Programs. So the webinar will be recorded, so you are aware of that. And uh, during the webinar, you have the possibility to ask questions. So if you look uh, at the bottom of the Zoom application, you will see this symbol or otherwise this one, depending on the operating system that you are using. So you can just click and type your question. We will read or we will unmute you at the end of the webinar. So after the webinar, when they started the Q&A section, if you don't write anything, so I will unmute you. If you write that you have no microphone, I will read the question for you. So after the webinar, you still have uh, the possibility to ask questions to Giacomo, Humbert, and uh, Jerome using the Bioxel Gromax, Bioxel.eu forum. In particular, if you type the tax colvars, it will be easy for them to see your question and answer directly to you. So something about today presenter. So um, Giacomo is a staff scientist at the National Institute for Health. Uh, he did a PhD at the CSA in Trieste, and then he moved to the USA working with Michael, Michael Klein. Uh, later, he got a research track faculty position at Temple University, and in 2020, he became staff scientist at the NIH, associated with the laboratory of Lucy Forsest and Jose Fernando Gomez. From starting from tw uh, 2007, Giacomo has developed together with Jerome and several other collaborators the program that he will tell us. So, Holvars. Humbert is a software engineer working at the laboratory of the chemie, of, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's a, a software engineer and his work at the laboratory, the chemie theorique of the Institute of Biolo uh, Biology, Physical Chemie. Sorry, my France is terrible, in Paris. His background is in computer science and structural bioinformatics. And he is maintaining a Unity Mall software and also other uh, visualization platform. And he has brought uh, the interface between Gromax and Colbars. And Jerome is a director of CNRS Center actually a research director of the same center where uh, Umbert is working, is training as a physical chemistry and computational chemistry in France, and he did also his, PhD, his uh, postdoc, sorry, with Michael Klein. In 29, he is, uh, since uh, 2009, he's working at the CRRS, and uh, his research is mainly focused on methodological and software development, with a specific focus on efficient sampling in molecular dynamic simulation. And its application mainly is a bio biological membrane. It is together with uh, Giacomo, a co-founder of Colbar Software. Now we will start with uh, Giacomo, followed by Umbert and then Jerome. So I will stop sharing and give the word to Giacomo, please. Thank you so much, Alessandra. And uh, thank you for having all of us here today. And thank you who have, to everybody who's listening in. And we hope that this presentation will give you a flavor of the kind of features and the kind of uh, science that we want to enable you to do. I'm going to start with an introduction of, and an example about the type of uh, functionality that you can access with the Corvus and Gromax. Then, uh, uh, Hubert will talk about the slightly more technical aspects of uh, 
how the interface is designed and how it works, meaning how to use it. And Jerome will give you, Jerome is going to give you a, via, a live demo of how to use the GUI that we have available in VMD for Colvers. And Colvers is a, a software library and this is a software a piece of software that we develop is uh, has the purpose of enabling enhancing uh, sampling simulations in MD uh, simulation programs. The library concept is a software engineering and development one. We, oft, we often refer to Colvers as a module because uh, for the point of view of how you use a software like uh, Gromax, for example, uh, Colvers starting, for, for example, for this version of Gromax, is always there available, so you don't have to do anything particular to use it other than to have Gromax pre-installed, at least from the version 24 that we're talking about today. However, this package, we develop it independently from softwares uh, like uh, Gromax or NAMD, LAMPS, etc. We have our own repository. We have a reference paper that is now several years old, and we have other papers that uh, describe features that were added to the code after that paper. And this is a brief timeline of what the code uh, evolved into. It started off as a patched version of NAMD and Gromax, like many other codes of this kind uh, do. And then we started writing in a way that it was suitable for packaging with uh, these mainstream applications uh, that uh, people use. We started first with NAMD, followed by LAMPS, uh, VMD, then uh, Jerome primarily wrote a GUI interface to um, graphical user interface to use Corvus inside VMD and interface with uh, TinkerHP. And lastly, we're talking uh, to you today about the interface with Gromax uh, and uh, trying to describe what uh, kind of features that uh, provides to you. I'm going to start off with an example immediately. The example is uh, supposedly uh, supposed to describe the kind of applications that you do in Gromax uh, very often, such as uh, atomistic or coarse-grained uh, simulations of membrane proteins. So this is the example that I'm showing today. This is a membrane protein that starts from an experimental structure, X-ray in this case, although in the recent years this has changed, the source of the structure can be a bit different from X-ray as we know. The important thing to know is, however, that the structure that we take from whatever method uh, that gives it to us does not tell us what is necessarily the orientation in the membrane of the protein. So the orientation in the membrane is described by some uh, empirical methods like PPM. And these methods, they give us uh, 3D coordinates for a protein that are most suitable to place a, a membrane, place a protein in a membrane that is aligned with the X, Y Cartesian plane. This is how you develop coordinates for these um, proteins from OPM and COMPASS or other database. Now, if we're doing this same kind of simulation in close grained we know that the strat internal structure of the protein is relatively restrained. We uh, don't allow for internal dynamics, which uh, is more much better described by atomistic force fields. So the primary changes that we're going to see are changes in, in the relative orientation and relative displacement of the protein and the lipid membranes. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about rotations here and rotations here of the protein on the membrane can, can, can be of two kinds. First, you can have spinning rotations, rotations around an axis, which is the same as the normal axis of the membrane. And these rotations are not very physically meaningful because they give us uh, the proteins uh, perceiving lipid molecules that are equivalent to each other all around. So oftentimes we try to fit the simulation after the fact to remove this kind of rotations from a trajectory or try to even stop the rotation from happening by freezing the argonal momentum of the protein from the beginning. And uh, we're going to show you an alter alternative way to do this because there's other kinds of rotations, like rotations that are away from the normal axis, such as tilting. These tilting rotations are more physically interesting because they actually change how the energy landscape and the forces that are perceived between the protein and the membrane. So these angles, uh, or functions of them, 
our collective variables, which we are defining using the software from the coordinates of the uh, atoms during the simulation. And these co variables are computed and we can also apply forces to these variables to achieve enhanced sampling and uh, visit states that corresponds to higher or lower values of these collective variables. This is in essence what we're trying to do with the, the software. So how to do it? We are going to see here how to write a configuration file for Corvus that is pretty much complete, ready to run, except of course for the topology and the, all the information that you have already for a standard Gromex simulation. First, as usual, we have to define some atom selections, some atom groups. And we load a Gromax format in this file. There is a little caveat here, which is not a very inconvenient to you, but has to be noted nonetheless. We do not read the index file from MD run. We have an internal reader because the Gromax index file format is useful. So we started using it long before we had an interface for Gromax and we kept that internal reader. So although the format is identical, you can shoot, you surely should, it would be simpler to keep the same index file for MD run and for Corvus, uh, but keep in mind that this is this file is being read in different places. But all of the format inside is equivalent, so nothing else to worry about. After having defined the atom groups, we select them and we use them to define a variable based on them. So here we are defining a collective variable named T, and this is of type tilt. Uh, meaning it's the cosine of a tilt angle. We use the cosine instead of the tilt angle itself for mathematical reasons that you can discuss later if you want. And this, uh, this cosine has range between minus one and one, and we can define the default spacing for any grid that will be defined for histograms, metadynamics, or BF, et cetera. We select the index group that is taken from the file. We provide reference coordinates for, in this case, the backbone atoms, backbone particles, uh, because this is a coarse grain simulation. And uh, these are taken from the initial structure uh, that we seed the entire run from. This defines completely how to, com how to compute the tilt collective variable. And it's very similar to how we define the spin angle collective variable, which is the this one here, except this, uh, we have a different keyword for the function and different ranges of values or resolution. Now, remember what I said, this kind of rotation, we don't want it uh, to happen, not because it's uh, um, the damaging or like wrong to happen in the system, but it's inconvenient to analyze the simulation when the protein keeps spinning around. So we stop this spinning rotation from happening by applying a harmonic restraint centered around zero, the initial value, on the spin angle variable. And the first constant is given in, in energy units for Gromax divided by the spacing that we've defined here, the width resolution, or it, if this uh, width is at the default value of one, this is exactly the same as the unit of the collective variable. Now, what this what does this coefficient file produce once we run the simulation with Gromax and Corvus enabled? Start, let's start from, from a simulation that has no restraints, uh, no force applied on the collective variables. And then where we can only compute them on the fly, of course, this will be equivalent to computing them after the fact in post-processing. As you see here, we run a relatively uh, long, no, since it's a small system, this is very cheap to do, a relatively long simulation, over 20 microseconds, the spin angle goes everywhere. And when we see that uh, the protein will have experienced all phases of the periodic unit cell. But the tilt has a much better defined energy landscape because it is defined by the uh, environment of the lipid membrane. So what we want is to suppress the spin rotations to prevent them from happening, but not disturb tilt rotations, let them happen because they're physically meaningful. And this is what we achieve using the harmonic restraint that I just showed. We stop the spinning angle from happening and from the first look it, look, it seems that the fluctuations of the tilt uh, or the tilt angle have not been perturbed. We should, of course, verify that this is true, not just from the time series, but also from the histogram. 
This is the histogram with the cosine of the third angle from uh, a no simula simulation without any restraints applied. And the peak of the distribution corresponds to approximately 10 degrees tilt rotation compared to the initial structure. So already we know that uh, the initial structure that was given by the empirical method PPM was decent, but it was not perfectly describing the protein membrane environment that uh, the explicit simulation gives us. And once we turn on the spin uh, restraint, then uh, we get almost exactly the same histogram. So we have achieved the goal of restraining some movements that we are not interested in while preserving the movements that we are interested in. Now, this histogram is uh, uh, give, uh, the result of a free energy landscape. And how to compute this free energy landscape? The typical way would be to invert this histogram and take the logarithm of it. And this is how the results, this is again from simulations with the equilibrium sampling where we're not doing enhanced sampling yet. This is what we have a minimum here, which as I said, corresponds to a rotation approximately 10 degrees uh, off the axis that was originally placed uh, in the original coordinates of the protein. And the minimum here is such that the interaction between protein and the membrane is optimal, meaning that there is as little as possible hydrophobic is matched between the different pieces of the transmembrane domain of the protein and the um, and the environment, lipid environment. We can ensure that this is true by calculating how much the membrane distorts around the protein by taking a 2D map of how much curvature there is for the membrane bending up or, or downward. And this is what I'm showing here, the membrane seen from the top view. And we see that uh, the membrane around it will distort slightly by one or two angstroms, but that's typical of what we see in membrane proteins. No membrane protein is perfectly symmetric like a cylinder, and they will always have some uh, small deviations up and down. Now, this is the global minimum. What does the environment of the membrane look like for the original structure for the original rotation? This is how it looks like here, where the membrane now is more distorted than it is at the minimum. And this is uh, presumably what is responsible for that higher free energy here of seven or eight kilojoules per mole. And the snapshot is uh, otherwise fairly equivalent to what we saw. As I said, we haven't done enhanced sampling yet. We would like, of course, to use it now to see what's happening here in this region that is poorly sampled because it's too high in free energy. <clears throat> so we use a very well-known method for enhanced sampling, metadynamics, and we apply it to the tilt collective variable. And these are the parameters of how much force we're putting in to achieve uh, further sampling in the regions of high free energy. And after we run for 20 microseconds, the same amount of time of the standard simulations that I showed before, this is the resulting PMF that we get, potential mean force that we get from metadynamics. And it nicely coincides with what we get from the standard sampling here, but extends it much higher in free energy to much larger tilt angles. And now since this is a, a unique advantage of enhanced sampling methods uh, that are based on collective variables, we can use the values of these collective variables to map out what these structures look like in terms of uh, um, physics and the uh, biochemistry of the membrane and the protein. And we see, for example, that we go, when we go to really high tilt angles or like really low cosines of it, there's a significant rotation with respect to the original structure. And this rotation comes at the cost presumably, and this cost is most likely due to the severe distortions of the membrane that we're causing now. We have tilted the protein too much so that the hydrophobic mismatch has become so big that the membrane has to twist around to accommodate it. And uh, this uh, structure here, we can also map it again in 2D by looking at the curvature map uh, on the XY plane of the membrane and see that this is indeed the case. Uh, what we have seen basically, we mapped different states along this collective variable from here to here. And what we have uh, identified where is calculated the potential mean force, the thermodynamics of this transformation. 
And we have also identified using binning of these uh, trajectory frames based on values of the collective variables. We are going to see a very intuitive way of binning these frames uh, later in the tutorial and live demo by Jerome. We can uh, extract frames and analyze them and find out what they are and where the physics of the PMF that we're calculating coming from. Uh, okay, now this was one example that uh, I'm giving you today, hopefully, hoping that it's useful to illustrate what are the unique features that you can achieve by the combination of Corvus and Gromex. And now Corvus is a library for an assembly methods with a fairly general purpose. So we have multiple algorithms supported. And now I'm going to speed up slightly because you're going to have this list uh, in the PDF at the end of the webinar. But basically we have harmonic restraints as I've just shown you that you can use. And you can use them, of course, not just to do static restraints, but to also perform a parallel sampling or to move them to do steer them D. You can use the adaptive bus enforce or ABF method that uh, Magnus told you about two weeks ago already in the Gromax 24 webinar where he mentioned Culver's. And the flavor that is particularly enabling Gromax is the extended system ABF that uh, was developed uh, by Jerome and co-workers. And metadynamics is also available there. And uh, I've used here the classic version by Lion Perinel original. There are diff other different uh, variations of this method that are available here, including uh, the ones that uh, allow you multiple workers for temper correction and the ensemble based uh, method by Fabrizio Marinelli, who allows you to target a custom distribution rather than the flat distribution for metadynamics. You can, of course, um, use other type of restraints that are specifically designed to increase the compliance of the simulation with experimental data. And these are listed here. And lastly, we can apply no restraints at all, but use the code, Corvus code itself to compute statistical properties. There will be too costly to compute if we were to save a trajectory with, with very fine spacing. So instead of saving terabytes of files, if you know already what you're interested in calculating, you could define it in the Corvus input and have it calculated uh, without having to store a lot of uh, time the uh, coordinates. And the collective variables that you can apply these methods to are several, to say the least. There's a lot of generality here. And hopefully that these variables that you can choose from can be tailored to your specific application. Of course, we'll be happy to answer any general questions that you may have for the forum. Keep in mind that this list is specifically for uh, Gromax 24. So these are the variables that are available there right now. There's additional functionality that we haven't been able to port to Gromax yet, but we will do in the near future. For example, there was one question at the last webinar about custom collective variables. We use, we define custom variables by combination, by mathematical functions of the existing ones using the laptop library. So that's not currently available in Gromax 24, but uh, we have a development version where you can use this library. We also have, uh, uh, variables specific to protein secondary structure. And uh, we have, uh, of course, ongoing efforts to make the code faster because this is more and more needed in recent times as we are uh, experiencing, and in particular to save time by removing duplicate com computation. We are enabling also communication between the multiple copies of Gromax and there's other stuff that is uh, not as finished as these things, but will be at some point. And if you are interested in development versions of Gromax, you can download them from here. I emphasize that this is a, a patched version of Gromax that is not reviewed by the Gromax team. So take it with a grain of salt. Of course, we're happy to answer questions about it if you want. And now we'll turn over to Hubert. We'll tell you about how to how the interface was designed and how to use it. <clears throat> Thank you, Giacomo. So I'll share my screen. So here for doing my part, I will uh, speak more about the design, the design and the usage of the Gromax Colvar interface. 
So we try to uh, create the interface to be uh, simple to use uh, for the for the user, and to be compatible uh, with most of the Gromax feature. So meaning that it's compatible with uh, classical integrators of Gromax. It's compatible with also GPU acceleration. And we designed the interface so that during uh, pre-processing time, during Groom PP time, we validate all uh, Colvar's inputs and along with Gromax one. And if everything is uh, correct, we bundle all information inside the TPR file uh, created by Gromax. Another feature uh, which is available within the interface is the Gromax checkpointing ability, meaning, meaning that if you need to continue or restart a simulation, uh, Colvar's based simulation, you can do it uh, with the checkpointing. A non, a currently known limitation of, uh, of the interface is that all Colvar computation is performed only on the main CPU node meaning that all uh, the Gromax computation can be done either on CPU or on GPU, depending on your inputs. But the Colvar's computation is done on the CPU, the main CPU node only. This could be a performance bottleneck if your collective variables is large. So you need, you need to take this into consideration when writing your Colvar's configuration file. For the resources, um, we have uh, documentation within the Gromax manual of 2024. And uh, for the Colvar sides, side, for, sorry, we have created a special reference manual of these Colvars within Gromax. Uh, how does uh, Gromax Colvar interface works under the hood? So basically, you have your um, your Gromax uh, standard MD loop, where you have your atom coordinates and you compute the atom forces through the force fields. And that, with the integrator, you get the new coordinates. So this is a standard MD loop. Oops, sorry. Then when you activate a Colvar-based simulation, you uh, retrieve a small set of atoms coordinates, the Colvar atoms you described. And from these Colvar atoms coordinates, you compute your collective variable, which, which can be, as Giacomo says, the distance, angle, and others. From these collective variables, you can compute a bias. And this bias you give you, you, will give you uh, additional forces on these collective variables. These, force, these forces are, are then uh, transformed to atomic forces on the correct uh, atoms. And these external atom forces are putting back to the Gromax MD engine so the MD loop can continue. Now in practice, how you can set up a Gromax Colvar simulation. So it's very simple. So uh, we added, there is two new MDP options to activate a Colvar simulation. The first one is Colvar-active, which need to be set to true to activate the Colvar simulation. And then you need to give uh, the path to your Colvar configuration files that Giacomo show the content uh, in his uh, demonstration. And to give the path of this uh, file, it will be uh, with the MDP option called callsars uh, config file. Then <clears throat> during pre-processing, you use a standard uh, Groom PP uh, command line with the same option as a standard simulation. And during this process, pre-processing phase, the Colvar's input will be passed by the library and make sure that uh, the input you gave is correct. And if it's, if it's the case, it will create the standard TPR file. One thing one thing to know is that, uh, as Giacomo showed, that you can have uh, inside your Colvar configuration file, you can have 
external files like index files, also coordinates for uh, RMSD, or some other files. All these external files will be embedded and stored inside the TPR file at the end of the pre-processing, meaning that once the TPR is created, this is the only file you need to run the simulation, and this is in the spirit of the Gromax uh, philosophy. Then to run the simulation, uh, it's the same as before, you use a standard MD run command line within the correct TPR you just created. And then the, the simulation is performed. And at the end, uh, you will see that Colvars produce its own output files. So usually you, you will have a .colvars.raj file, which corresponds to the trajectory of your collective variables. And also you can have additional files depending on the feature you used uh, within the uh, Colvars configuration file. So you can have .pmf, .cont, etc. All these Colvars output files, the prefix of these files will be the same as the .udr prefix of Gromax, of the energy file of Gromax, meaning that if the udr is, dot, is called md.edr, you will, you will have md.colvars.raj or md.pmf, etc. And finally, we the interface support restarting and continuation of simulation because all Colvar information is stored inside the checkpoint file of Glomax, which is a .cpt file. So meaning that if you want to continue your simulation, you use also a standard uh, MD run command line for continuation. And the Colvars will uh, continue to, uh, to compute as, uh, as usual. And also we have a text version of this information if you want to, if you have to have more information which will have the name, the suffix name of state. And that's all for my part. I wanted to you give, to give you another view of how to run Colvars within Gromax. And now I will let uh, Jerome speak and uh, give his demo about the Colvar dashboard. Thank you, Hubert. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so now we've seen, uh, let me share my screen. We have learned how to write configuration files, but my favorite way of writing configuration files is when I don't have to write them and someone writes them for me. So here, um, <clears throat> since many people who use Gromax also use VMD and the others maybe should, uh, if you have VMD, what I did here is, is uh, I loaded a trajectory that I computed before, um, where there's this, uh, you know, this is all atom model of a protein, and this ligand is escaping from the protein. It's escaping because I've applied external passing forces using Colvars, of course. So now I now I want to um, do two things. One is analyze this trajectory, what's happening, using collective variables. And the second thing is I want to set up new biased simulations with this system. So what I'm going to do in VMD is I just open the extension analysis Colvars dashboard here that's included in the, in the current alpha versions of VMD. And this opens a little graphical interface that is basically uh, going to let me know what's happening in collective variable space while I look at what's happening in the molecular space here. So imagine I want to look at the ligand uh, exiting from the cavity. So I'm going to define coordinates and the simplest way I can do is using the VMD system of labeling uh, distances. So if I press two, VMD lets me label the distance between two atoms of the uh, ligand and, uh, and protein respectively. Of course, this is just a VMD label, it's not a collective variable. So I go back to the Colbert dashboard window and I click on this here under automatic call bars. I have call bars from VMD labels. If I click this, this is going to import the VMD label into a collective variable. And now if I animate, you know, the collective variable is being computed in real time because the call bars library is embedded inside the, um, the VMD binary. Now what I see is that this distance is computed in angstroms. But if I'm going to be using call bars in Gromax, you know, when linked to Gromax, Colvars uses the Gromax units. 
So the distance is going, distances are going to be nanometers. So here I can change the unit system within VMD. The Colvars interface will do the conversion. I just get a warning message that I'm changing the units. And now it's computing this distance in nanometers. So now it's going to be compatible with whatever I'm going to see when I run a simulation with Gromax. Uh, now, of course, this distance is not really what I want because it's two random atoms between the uh, the protein and ligand. So I'm going to refine this a little bit. And to refine it, I'm going to edit it by double clicking. So if I double click this, it opens an editor. And you can see it's defined one of these inputs. I'm going to make a simpler name. I'm going to rename it to just D. And this group of atoms is the ligand. Instead of just the atom numbers, I want to have all maybe heavy atoms of the ligand. And for that, I'm going to reuse uh, I don't know the atom numbers, but I have a representation for this in VMD. So I'm going to grab the atom selection from the representation. It's like this, res name, league, and knowledge. So I click this, and now it has replaced my selection with the other atoms. And the second group is the protein atoms. I don't want one atom. I want all the alpha carbons. So now I'm going to use the VMD selection text that I type into this box, alpha, and I press Enter. And now I have the alpha carbons. You can wrap the line to see all the alpha carbons. OK, so now Control s to or apply here. I've now changed the definition of my distance to include all these atoms. How do I know that I've changed it? Well, I can double check this by selecting this and clicking the Show Atoms button. So now this is displaying in different colors the atoms that are used to define the different atom groups. Maybe I have some noise from this extra presentation. I'm going to hide it here. So now I see that I'm, I'm using the center of mass of these red atoms and the center of mass of the of the gray atoms from the protein. So how does this coordinate behave? Well, I can look, I can plot a timeline for this. The plots are here. So the timeline shows that, well, this is a ligand uh, exiting the cavity. And if I animate, I have a time cursor that shows me where I'm, uh, what I'm looking at in trajectory. And if there is a specific event that I'm interested in, I can click in this window. And this takes me to the right point within the trajectory. So this is making a very quick connection between the space of collective variables to the left and the space of uh, you know, molecular coordinates to the right. Uh, I can also, sorry, I can also navigate using the keyboard here and I can zoom using the up and down arrows to look at some you know, events in great detail. Okay, so this is the distance coordinate um, and I, I see the exit. Maybe there's more stuff happening than just the distance. So let me hide these atoms. And you know, this ligand here is flexible one. It has it has rotatable bonds in the middle. So I'm going to tag one of these bonds, like the dihedral angle, to see what's happening to it. So again, using VMD, I press 4. And this lets me select four atoms. And now I've labeled the dihedral angle. So same as before, I'm just going to convert this to a collective variable. Now it's made a duplicate of the distance, which I don't need. And this is the dihedral angle. If I want to double check, I'm looking at the right dihedral. I can show these atoms. OK, that's fine. These are the atoms I want to see. So now, how does, how does this dihedral behave? Um, I can see it's fluctuating. So it seems to be, you know, um, it seems to be a uh, indeed a flexible dihedral. So now I can look at different events. And if I want a better view, I would like to know if this is really a multimodal distribution. So for that, I click this histogram button here. So this just computed a histogram of the dihedral, and it's indeed showing a multimodal distribution. So now, if I animate the trajectory, this is showing me the cursor is showing me where I'm, you know, what value I'm looking at in the histogram, and I can click somewhere in the histogram, and this is going to take me to the frame with the nearest value of the variable. So that means, if I see multiple states here, I can click on one of these, and I'm going to explore the frames corresponding to the various states here. So this is what Giacomo, what Giacomo was referring to when he mentioned, you know, binning according to one coordinate and then exploring what this means in practice. Uh, so now I have the different configurations of the ligand uh, as available as different modes. Okay, so this is one way. And then one question I could ask is, so first I can edit this because I don't like this long name. I'm going to shorten the name. There we are. I could ask, so is there a correlation between the you know, ligand exiting the cavity and these changes in configuration? Well, to look at correlation, I can select uh, you know, two variables and click on the third type of plot, which is the pairwise plot. This is really a scatter plot with one collective variable 
uh, here and the other positive variable as the y-axis. So what I can see here is each of these points is a frame and I can look for any kind of correlation between the, the distance here and the dihedral angle. If I animate now, the red dot follows you know, the trajectory. And if anything, if I, I see a substate that's of interest, I can click on these dots. And this, again, takes me to the relevant frame. So I can add, oh, what is this frame here with the lowest point of the dihedral? Um, so now, you know, this gives me a lot of tools to explore uh, the trajectory according to these. Um, now, these were um, coordinates, you know, describing the uh, ligand protein uh, geometry, the relative geometry. I'm going to clear some of the labels here in VMD because that's noisy. So let me clear these labels. And now, what about the protein? Can I look at what's happening to the protein? So if I'm not really inspired, I can define um, a set of classic protein coordinates by clicking again in these automatic colvars. There's a button protein nucleic acid autocolvars. So if I click this, it's detected a protein and it's just defined a series of classic coordinates. The RMSD of the protein uh, with the reference, the as a reference, the first frame of this trajectory, the radius of gyration, a measure of its global orientation, and this has four components because it's a rotation quaternion. So it's like a rotation matrix, essentially. And this is what gets decomposed into the spin angle and the tilt coordinates that Giacomo was mentioning earlier. The orientation angle is just a measure of the global rotation. So it's a scalar and it's the global angle of rotation from the reference position. And what you can see here is that this is nearly zero. What this means is uh, this trajectory has been aligned rotationally. So there is no rotation. But what I can do now is I could run a little experiment in VMD. I can just you know change the coordinates. I'm going to rotate my protein and press F5, and now it's recomputed all the collective variables, and you can see that I've rotated my protein by exactly 39, 97 degrees. Um, so this is one one point of this is that you can really experiment by changing coordinates literally in VMD, and then recomputing the values of the variables to explore how the coordinates depend. Uh, on the uh, on the like how the how the collective variables depend on the Cartesian coordinates, um, and another thing I can do is if some coordinates, uh, you know, if the meaning the physical meaning of some coordinates is not very clear, I can display their gradient, which is the derivative of the coordinate with respect to Cartesian coordinates. I'm going to do that for for example for the uh, orientation angle. So I show gradients here, and this is showing me how each how the collective variable depends on the position of each atom. And if I rotate the view, I can see that you know this is the rotation, the net rotation that the protein has uh, undergone from the reference. And so this is the gradient of the rotation object. I could also plot uh, the, the uh, gradient of the radius of gyration. And this is very simple. You know This is how you increase the radius of gyration, et cetera. So sometimes here, this is kind of trivial, but if you have a very complex coordinate, uh, it's very useful to be able to plot the gradient. So now that I have, suppose I've explored the space of possible coordinates. Uh, and then, um, so what I, should, what I should say is when I'm editing the configuration for a coordinate, I have a, a number of helpers. So the helpers would be different templates uh, at different levels. I can, I showed you the selection helpers. I can also directly insert specific you know, bonds, angles, and dihedrals from VMD here. And I can also uh, include files uh, that, uh, that are used to define coordinates. And if in doubt, I have links to the different parts of the relevant documentation here. Now, suppose I want to apply a restraint uh, to, for example, the protein RMSD. I can just right click on it. If I right click on it, there is a little option add harmonic bias. And now this opens another editor for the harmonic bias. Maybe let's restrain it around zero. Um, and the force constant is really not very meaningful in VMD, but in Gromax, it's going to be the Gromax units. Um, now I can go under this biases tab and I see that I've defined the harmonic bias and it is computing what the bias energy would be on a given frame. So this is a way to preview uh, what the what the bias is going to is going to do. 
once I'm happy with this configuration, I can just save here. This is going to save all the variables I've defined and the biases into a file. And that file can be directly fed into uh, Grom PP. And then I can run Gromax with uh, this modified or biased uh, dynamics. So this is in short, uh, how you can use Colvars in VMD using this Colvars, Colvars dashboard plugin to visualize and analyze trajectories and to explore the space of collective variables intuitively. Another thing you can do is if you have collective variables that are, um, that are machine learned or, you know, uh, data, uh, based on, uh, on, on data analysis, you can also load them into this interface to, for instance, display a gradient or experiment with them uh, to get a better intuition of what they mean. Um, now, I think this uh, concludes this demo. So I'm just going to uh, thank you uh, all for listening. And we really want to thank everyone who contributed code to, our, uh, to the library uh, through mostly the GitHub repository. And there is, uh, there is many people we want to thank the members of the Gromax team, especially Magnus and Burke, who uh, you know helped us, helped us and guided us uh, for you know to make sure that Colvars plays really nicely with the Gromax uh, philosophy. We want to thank our colleagues both in Bethesda and in Paris, and of course uh, BioXL and Alessandra for hosting this. So thank you for listening, and uh, please try this out and let us know what you think. Thank you very much. It was a nice uh, going around with the cold bar. Now we start with uh, Pedro as the first question. Now, Pedro, I just um, try to unmute you. Here is Pedro. Yeah, now you should be able to speak. No? No, maybe he doesn't have the microphone. I forgot all yeah. of you. Ah, you can speak. Please yeah. go ahead. Sorry, Pedro. Yeah. Can, can, can we use uh, AWH uh, with Grom, with callbacks in Gromax? Uh, not yet, unfortunately, but it would be nice to do. But AWH is also uh, part of the Gromax feature. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to use it without callbars as a standard. Uh... Sure. But... But AWH, AWH does not implement all the collective variables that Colvars implements. So that's sure. the reason why it would be nice to interface them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I, can, I can ask now the question, right, Paul? Yeah, so you can ask, uh, you have several questions. Yeah, if you not, <laughs> if they are not too long, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you want to install the, this uh, Colvars with Gromax you need to fetch that from GitHub, yeah? The code no. from Colbus. Chromax 2024 has it. Just get Chromax 2024. Okay, that, that's included, okay. And it's, yes, it's compiled by default when you compile Chromax. So... Okay, that, that's good, that's good, yeah. The, the, the next one, the, the, you mentioned the machine learning uh, features from Colbus is is supported in Chromax, right? Uh, so, uh... one... okay. Okay. Yeah, the one thing that's supported is if you have a, uh, a neural network function of uh, collective variable values, then you can feed the network weights um, and define that as collective variable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the units of the biases are automatically put in Gromax units. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So cool. when uh, when Corvus runs with the MD engine like Gromax or NAMD, it uses always the same units as that engine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, there is another question now from Khan that is asking: Can indiscrete general or general collective variable also be defined, such as a single union subset of a a greater atom molecule set. And then he's asking if he has some issue that you can read it concerning. I am struggling with deprotonating an amino group without defining a distance CV and selecting a specific hydrogen atom with plume. Could this be achieved with cold bars? 
and we we'll need men. Yeah, we need more details about this probably to answer. Yeah, I, think, I guess yeah, we so. need to talk separately, maybe. Yeah, so you can post on the forum and they can answer you mm -hmm. because there you have the chance. Uh, but uh, maybe it can, you can just answer if can a discrete or general collective variable also be defined? So we have the uh, like general, like we have path collective variables where you define a series of snapshots in coordinates through coordinate files, and then you have the variable that defines the progress along that path and the distance along that path that there's been several versions of that developed by Parinello's lab and others. So that is one example of general collective variables. And of course, everything is general with respect to some things and not others. So again, like uh, yeah. if you can tell us a little more, then we can, we're happy to guide you. Yeah, so please go to the forum and ask. Use the tag the call bar so they see it immediately. So now we have some question from Andre. Andre, I unmute you. Yeah, you should be able to speak now. No? Okay, I can just read them for Andrea. Okay. Uh, what about performance with respect to classical MD? It to plum engine. That is his first question. Uh, uh, I mean, so... I think it, it means if you run Gromax with Colvard, what is the respect that compared to? This yeah. is my guess. As general rule of thumb, it will always be slower because you're doing additional computation and you're introducing initial communication when you're running in parallel. How much slower can be rel relatively little, if not noticeable as was the use case that Magnus was uh, telling us two weeks ago when he was like, the I see no difference between running with the standard uh, Gromach simulation one with covers. Of course, there will be many cases where you will see a performance impact and then it will be up to you to decide if it's uh, acceptable to you. What we try as much as possible is to make it easy to you to test it and then decide whether it's uh, efficient and it, there are some general rules that we can help you understand, uh, make some examples with the caveats that every system is different, every piece of hardware is different. Uh, one example that I can make is for the simulation of the membrane protein in Martini. There was a very small system that ran on one node. Uh, even that node was a little too powerful to run that system, but Gromax was just running standard simulation at 13 microseconds per day. And they, depending on what features of Colvars were introduced, it will go down to 11 or nine. So that was a bit slower for that. And there were, and some of the optimizations that I was telling you about earlier, they will be happy, they will help you to reduce that gap. But that's one example where you're really pushing Romax to the scalability limit. And then you have, uh, of course, the impact of the additional communication and computation. But that's certainly like a more of a worst case scenario than what Magnus was referring to before as, a, yeah, you have no performance penalty. There will be some, and the, we're, work, we're gonna be working to make that smaller or help you decide, help you tailor the input file to make this smaller in your simulation. Thank you. He has a final question, Andrea, for Jerome. The sim I think you mean the simulation that you have shown is biased or is a classical simulation? That was biased. That had a non-equilibrium bias. Uh, yes, okay. it was ABMD, adiabatic bias MD. Oh, thank you. So now there is a question from Milos. I tried to unmute him. I may maybe be able to speak, Milos. Mm. Milos, could you speak? No, I guess not. Okay, so then uh, is the metadynamics model, in the metadynamics model, is there an option to obtain statistical weights and perform reweighting? I do not understand exactly what, it, what is meant by that, uh, but we can print the value of the bias at different times and the time series of the Gaussians that are printed. So you can optionally write out a text file, which is uh, 
the same as the hill fa hills file that you have in Prune. So any post-processing analysis method relating that you're using for Prune that runs with that file can run just the same on the file that is produced from Corvers. Okay, thank you. So then we have Bush, Bushra that has a long question that I suggest on uh, yeah on a specific things on the yeah on PCA. And so then I suggest she he or she is posting on the forum. Thank you very much. So I uh, oh, I think I can answer very quickly because I think they, they okay, won't. Okay, so I have to read. Wait, wait. I have to read the question then. Okay. Because otherwise the other do not understand. I'm currently working on well tempered simulation of one protein. I recently used the atrial and distance change for my meta dynamics. However, I also made PCA of this protein and obtained eigenvector and, eigen and eigenvalues. I'm curious about how I can give these variables as a collective variables. I mean, as, I mean the vectors. I think so. The, the answer is. Vectors. We so we have a, a function type that is called eigenvector. It's exactly what you need. OK, thank you very much. Then I just read through, because then it's faster. We can go through other more questions. Do you plan, Peter is asking, do you plan to incorporate also multi-map in the call bar for Gromax? Uh, yes, uh, I, don't, I cannot uh, say exactly when, because I implemented multi-map in MD using functions that are part of NAMD. And as you may know, that, that's all that's called that first of all is works best there, but it also NAMD has a restrictive license. You cannot just take that code and bring it elsewhere. So I would have to rewrite that functionality that uh, to make it more portable. But definitely I have used I had used cases with multimap where I needed Gromax functionality and uh, I would like to have it available. So at some point yes. Yeah, thank you. Now, Andre uh, is asking as, about GPU. Is it is planned to support update on GPU with call bars? You don't know. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we will have to yeah. figure out. Uh, for, I would want to emphasize here how uh, how difficult the task that Hubert undertook over the last couple of years to uh, integrate two pieces of software that are both moving over time. And uh, so that once that was achieved, that was our main priority, then we would like to go deeper and understand exactly how to interface with the, the rest of the Gromax code. But that uh, it's a complex work that to, we can tell you more once we're doing it, uh, mm -hmm. once we're more okay. in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No. Uh, oh, do you want to see something? No, 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 it's no. okay, no. But... Uh -huh. Yes, okay. it will be a complicated task, so not sure in the near future, at least. Yeah, I guess. Um, our plan to add a scripting interface similar to how TCL script in MD can be used to create complex protocols such as uh, the string mm -hmm. method. So the good news is uh, we have generalized the TCL embedding. So actually, you can now build, if you want to, you can patch Gromax and build it with TCL scripting support. So um, I'm not sure it's in our fork, but we can definitely update our fork so it, it contains optional TCL scripting. Yeah, thank you. There is another question. There are two questions that I will go through, the last two that are here. When developing implementing callbars, do you have access to Gromax neighboring list from within no, the callbar code? No, nope. no, no, we don't have. No, okay. And the last question: uh, It will be visible to compile certain Chromax version with a certain CV. I have, I don't understand completely. If the you question. modify the code, yeah, I'm not sure what the question is. Maybe we should mm. talk on the forum about this. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's better speci because specify um, which CV you, yeah. you have in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Please, Andre, answer uh, post on the forum. So I will close now. We are uh, at four o'clock. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, we will have a new webinar uh, soon, but it's not known. In April, after Easter, we will be a new occasion. And you will, if you follow the BioXL LinkedIn or uh, Twitter, you will know about that. So I'm looking forward to see you again. And thank you very much. And thank you for our speaker. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Anders. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Alexander. Bye. Thank you.